Hey folks, thanks for tuning in. I'm Piano Man Steve Lundgren, founder of the PianomanApproach.com, creator of the Piano Man Approach online piano course, and also uh, I once went by the URL of learningmusicisfun.com, which will also take you to the same place. I appreciate you being here. We're doing a song demonstration video today for uh, one of the uh, all-time leading stream streaming songs. This is uh, by The Police from 1984, Every Breath You Take. Some people associate it with Sting, but it is originally from The Police. So before we get into the video, just really quick, if you enjoy free content like this, I would sure appreciate it if you'd give this video a like. Subscribe to my channel so that you don't miss notifications about future content. And uh, also, of course, share it and leave comments and all those good things that help me uh, do well in the algorithm and reach new people. We really appreciate that. So, but I know you're not here uh, for that. You are here for the content. So we're going to get cranking on that and uh, just make sure that the piano is... Yep, it's showing up here on my recording monitor, so I think we're okay. So, uh, and of course, uh, if you uh, would like to know more about my work, uh, down in the description I have links to the pianomanapproach.com. There's some free goodies over there, and you can join my mailing list to get uh, notifications for new free content every single week. So we welcome you to join our community. We would love to have you over there. Okay, so what we're going to be doing here in in, uh, in song demonstration, this is not a note-for-note note tutorial as much as what we're going to do is show you how you use my method, which is uh, chords and rhythm patterns and... Uh, very simple improv techniques to learn basically any song. And we're going to run my magic five-step formula for learning songs that I call the glide formula through this one. And you can see how this process works. Uh, many of you are already students. And so this is just going to give you added depth from what you already have from my paid course. And some of you are not, but hopefully it will introduce you to a way of approaching the piano that maybe uh, would serve you better than the traditional way of reading notation on a staff on a piece of paper. Okay, so as always, uh, we are going to be using the glide formula. So let me bring the glide formula up here on the screen for you so you can see what we're dealing with. It's an acronym. Each letter stands for something, as you can see. The first letter is G the word glide and of course the reason i call it the glide formula is because you can glide through learning just about any song using these five steps and g stands for get the chords okay so in some cases you can find the chords for free with song lyrics with just a google search uh other times maybe you have to purchase them maybe you have to buy some sheet music or something but when you get the sheet music or the fake book or whatever we're gonna pretty much be ignoring the notes on the staff. We're going to be looking above to what most people consider the guitar chords. They're really just the chords, but uh, a lot of people do associate them with guitar, and a lot, big part of what we do here is that uh, when people uh, use these chords with like acoustic guitars, they have strumming patterns and things. Well, you can use the same kind of uh, effect or the same kind of approach on piano. So step two is L, listen to the song. That, in these days, you can do just about anywhere you want for free. You can do it on YouTube, usually, uh, Spotify, Apple Music. Uh, most of these places, either you have a, a membership for a very low monthly rate, or most of them you can do it for free if you're willing to sit through an ad every once in a while. So you find the song and you have a listen. Step three is I, and you identify the feel. And what this basically means is we're going to find the core rhythm pattern that's going to turn those chords into an approximation of the recording. Now, there's four essential feels or uh, rhythm patterns that I teach in my piano course. Um, and 
there's an endless number of ways to sort of modify them and create variations. So there's more than just four, but there's four core ones, and we try to figure out which of these essential feels is the right one for the song. Step four is D, you drill it down, which is where you take a really, really simple version of the song, meaning just the chords and that key rhythm pattern, and you just run through it a few times and get it under your fingers so that you are not wondering, you know, how to get from this chord to this chord and whatnot, because then as you start bringing other things in, you won't be using brain power just to get the basics done. So we drill it down without any frills. And then step five is that you is E, which is you enhance with simple improv and signatures, meaning that you use easy improvisation techniques based on the chords that you're already playing. And then you can add in some more specific and precise signature lines that are identified with that tune if it calls for that and if you know them from various sources. And we'll talk about that. So let me get that off the screen and get back to our teaching apparatus here. All right, so now that you know the process, let's assume that you've made it through steps one and two, and that you've got the chords and you've listened to the tune. And uh, I have the lyrics and the chords in the video description on YouTube here. Just scroll down, you'll see them, so you don't even have to go looking for them anywhere else. Just to make it a little bit simpler for you here in this video. And uh, we're ready to pick out our essential feel. So if you had listened to the song, you would have heard, you know, I'm going to play something kind of specific, but you'd have heard something like... So you'd have heard that. And then so now what we have to do is, since you're listening to the song, we have to run the chord sequence through the different rhythm patterns and see which one kind of fits it the best, right? One of them is usually going to jump out and be the winner. Now this song, I'm, I'm calling it the key of A. For those of you who listen to this, this is something that, run, that happens every once in a while with songs that are uh, older. Uh, particularly back when they did everything on magnetic tape and they didn't and before the digital era of recording. And that is, it really doesn't sound like A and it really doesn't sound like A flat. They clearly messed around with the tape speed just a little bit and it, and it affected the, it affected the, the, what it sounds like as far as the, the key, it sounds like it's somewhere in between, like a quarter step off. So, but I looked around at different live settings and um, I keep seeing Sting doing it in the key of A. So I'm going to assume that that's the key that they actually recorded it in and that the tape slowed was slowed down just ever so slightly and that's why it's off. So that can be a little frustrating because it's harder to play along with the recording when you feel like you're always out of tune with it. But that just happens sometimes with older songs. So... I'm going to just quickly run through the chords <clears throat> in this song, or at least for a little bit of the chords in this song, through these essential feels that I teach and see which one sounds right, okay? So the first thing that we're going to do is immediately eliminate my fourth, uh, one of those four feels is called the waltz feel, and that is for songs in 3-4 time, or 6-8 time for that matter. We know this isn't. This is one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. It's got four beats. So we're only going to be looking at three of those four because we know it's not going to be this. Okay? It just can't work out. The math doesn't work. So we start out with what I call the basic feel, and that's where you're playing quarter notes in your left hand. One. And just to have something to do with the right hand, the right hand is going to uh, have a lot more flexibility than the left hand in, in this method of playing. But when we're trying to establish the feel, I just come down on beats two and four with the right hand. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So let's see how this works. 
every breath you take Every move you make F sharp minor Every vow you break D Every single day I'll be watching you F sharp minor yeah, that kind of works. It's a little choppy, though, right? It's like, that's not real satisfying. Okay, so let's try the country feel. That's probably not going to work, but we'll we'll see. Not all songs that use the country feel are necessarily country songs, and not all country songs necessarily use the country feel. But there is a high correlation. That is where you're playing in the left hand. You're playing the root of the chord alternating with the five of the chords. So if you were to start on your scale, one, two, three, four, five, that's the five. Six, seven, one, okay? So you're going back and forth between one and five, one and five. <clears throat> and then in between, you're coming down on a chord. One. Like this. Every breath you take, every move you make. <laughs> I don't think this one's probably going to work. It's kind of fun though, right? It's like, well, I suppose we could we could rearrange it if we wanted to have a hoe down and play this song. Every breath you take, every move you make. Or maybe we could turn it into a polka. <laughs> but if we're trying to sound like the recording, probably not going to work. So what's our third option? Our third option is what I call the heartbeat feel or the syncopated feel. I have both of those words work because it's syncopated for sure and it sounds like a heartbeat. It's one, two, and three, and four, and one, and two, and three, and four. Thump, thump, thump. heartbeat right and then in the right hand you're just playing quarter notes over the top of it one two three four now spoiler alert this particular rhythm pattern is the most common rhythm pattern in all of popular music some kind of syncopated bass like that, okay? And this this is sort of a catch-all for that stuff. So, we try it out. Every breath you take Every move you make Every vow you break Every single day I'll be watching you Okay? To me, this is the one that works best. Now, I will point this out because this is a good moment for it. Not You get to be the decider in chief about whether this is the right rhythm pattern or not in any given song. You can try any rhythm pattern you want. Some songs fall into a little bit of a gray area where two different rhythm patterns could work. And it's really just a matter of which one you think does the job the best. And it might come down to picking one and making some modifications to it. Uh, the thing is, if you listen closely to the record, what's really going on is they're playing eighth notes underneath it. It's so one would think, well, wouldn't that be more like the basic feel, right? The trouble with that is, especially if you try to do eighth notes, you could try to do it like this. Every breath you take, right? Or maybe you try to soften it up a little bit because that's kind of clunky, and so you kind of go with octaves like this. The difficulty with that is, is that when most songs that have that going on, <clears throat> one, 
it's not just that the bass guitar is doing that. It's that the bass guitar is doing that, and there's a drum beat happening at the same time, and the effect that you're hearing is the combination of the two. And usually what the drummer is doing is reinforcing certain beats among that. The other thing that's happening is that a bass guitar, the guy if they who's playing or the, or the girl who's playing – can smooth it out a little bit. They can they can really create kind of a nice smooth legato flow, and they're usually using their fingers as opposed to a pick, for example. Like that, and so it's not real clunky, right? And the attack isn't really clunky. And then underneath it, there's a drum beat coming along, and the kick drum is going. Right or something like that, and so the effect that you're hearing is much more like the syncopated feel than it is like the bass guitar going boom 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 boom, and the attack on a piano, no matter how you do it, is just never going to be as smooth. Like the timbre of the instrument is just never going to be as round and smooth as a bass guitar, so it's always going to be muddy and clunky when you're trying to be that active down there. There's a time and a place for that when that's what the song calls for. But this particular song is so laid back. If it were me, you get to be the choice for you. But if it were me, I would trend more toward the syncopated feel than the basic feel because it just gets too clunky. So much more... captures the flow of the song better in my view than every breath you take every move you make but again if you like that go for it there's no rules here you're not breaking any rules you are the decider so once we have that in place and we're for the purposes of this video we're going to say that we've chosen the uh, the heartbeat syncopated feel. So now we go on to the next step, which is D, drill it down. And that means that we're just going to run through the chords in that very, very simple form. We're going to play the simplest form of the chord. We're not going to try anything fancy and just kind of get it under our, under our hands. So it would be something like this, and I'm going to play it at a little bit slower tempo than the song so that you can kind of follow along, and I'm going to call the chords out. But as I said... Down in the video description, if you scroll down, I've got the chords kind of synced up with the with the lyrics as they happen. So, A. F sharp minor. D. I'm going to move on to the next section where he says, oh, can't you see? Okay. Goes to a D chord. Then a C chord. A. Now it goes to a B chord. And then to an E chord. back to A. Same place as we've been. And then there's another section where he's like, since you gone, I've been lost without a trace, feeling da 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 in your embrace. Okay. That section, it goes to an F. Since you've gone, I've been lost without a trace. Now G Back to F. G. Back to F. Baby, baby, A, please. Right back. 
back to that basic the basic kind of flow of the A to the F sharp minor goal here is to just run it through at that you know to that place where you're not making a bunch of mistakes running through the chord uh, the chord sequence right and um, for some people this is about as far as you'll be able to go depending on how much experience you've got and what your skill level is the beautiful thing about it is this is actually a pretty darn good sounding facsimile already before we've even added any like you know, enhancements of any kind, it sounds pretty good. Every breath you take, every move you make, every I'll be watching you. That's all the farther that you can go with it at this point. First, all moments in time are temporary, so you'll you can develop the skills to go farther. But that's a pretty darn good place to start, you know, and which is what I enjoy very much about this method is that at a very low skill level with this method, you can do that. At a very low skill level with reading music, uh, there's very, very limited stuff available to you. Uh, you might not even be able to play two hands together. Um, and and certainly you're not doing much with chords. So it's a much, much shorter learning curve with this style of play than uh, with uh, sort of the traditional method. It, there's nothing wrong with being able to read music, but it is not, first, it's not the way that popular music is composed. Um, so... I think it's already, uh, it starts out as maybe an, an imperfect or a, a less effective way to express this kind of music to begin with, even when you do it well. And secondly, the learning curve of becoming really good at reading notes on the page is one that is so long that it really weeds most people out of playing the piano before they really get any real traction. So I like this, not necessarily to say, don't learn how to read music. I'm not particularly good at it, never have been, but it's a wonderful thing and it, it, it's something that's great to have as a skill set, but it isn't necessary to do this well. Um, and and it, this allows you to play more fun things much, much faster. So I think this is a really good point of entry for a lot of people. And then if you're interested in uh, mastering reading notes on the page you can keep working on it too there's nothing wrong i know some people who are quite good at both and they are monsters on this instrument okay so now that we've drilled it down it's time to do the final step which is enhance we're going to enhance this song and there's two main places to look for the enhancements we have rhythmic enhancements and we have harmonic enhancements. Rhythmic is where you're going to create sort of exciting or interesting moments with timing and articulation of the chords that you're playing. Uh, harmonic is where you're actually going to enhance the chords that you're playing by maybe changing the voicing or by adding some notes and making the chords more complex and you know, potentially a little more interesting to the ear. There's absolutely no rule that says you can't do both of these kinds of enhancements at the same time. So let's go over a few of the simple ones. My favorite uh, rhythmic maneuvers are what I call toggles and, of course, arpeggios. Arpeggio is not my word, but toggle is. <laughs> and so let's just take a chord here and we're going to play our rhythm pattern on it. All right. Now a toggle is where you actually play the top part of the chord, but not your thumb, and then you toggle down to the thumb and back. 
And there's a lot of different ways you can do that rhythmically, but that toggling is a great way to take the chord that you're already on and do something with it that creates sort of a nice, uh, the rhythmic aspect of it alone makes it a nice enhancement, either to adjust the rhythm pattern itself or possibly to fill some space in between, you know, the, the melodic lines that you're singing or that might be getting played uh, instrumentally. So, so let me give you an example here. If we were going to add some of this in just to adjust the rhythm pattern a little bit, we keep going down here. So just off the top of my head, see how I'm like thumb up here, toggle, thumb toggle, thumb toggle. And it smooths it out a little bit, gives a little bit of, makes it sound different, even though rhythmically it's really the same thing as we were doing when we were just playing the straight quarter notes. Versus this. That's just something that kind of helps make it feel a little bit better, right? So I love that. Arpeggios are when you play the individual notes of the chord together, usually in some kind of a sequence, up or down. But honestly, to, in, for our purposes, it doesn't matter. It's just a matter of playing the individual notes instead of as a block, like a chord. And so that would that could be down, could be up could be a mixture it doesn't really matter it's individual notes getting played individually in inside the rhythm pattern as opposed to just a block chord so the way it sounds with that sort of descending arpeggio but you can mix it up and do some of each you know you just have options and you can be doing some toggling and then go to an arpeggio. One of the things that I enjoy most is that when you have little tools like this in your toolkit, they're transferable to a lot of different songs. So it's not like you're just learning one thing just for this song and then you have to reinvent the wheel on the next song. You're actually taking this technique and then it can be applied to other songs. But I like being able to make those choices in the moment, and I like having different tricks to use at different times in the song because it's like, well, the rhythm pattern really doesn't change in different sections of the song, but I want different sections of the song to sound a little different. So I change what I'm doing with my right hand even as my left hand stays the same, and it creates a slightly different sonic flavor for that part of the song. So it could be like... You want to kind of lean into, you just kind of want to lean into like these kind of more laid back. Every breath you take, every move you make, every vow you break, everything you think, I'll be watching you. Then maybe when you get to the part where he says, Oh, can't you see? Now 
now you change it over to a toggle, for example. Can't you see? You belong to me. How a fool it is. With every breath you take. Then maybe back to the little arpeggio thing. Every value break. And then it gets to this other section, and because you want it to be a little heavier, maybe you just go to the quarter note pounding, right? Because it's it's heavier, even though it's less busy. By doing that with your right hand, by changing what you're doing rhythmically and making those little enhancements, you can create a different sound for each section of the song, even though you have not changed the rhythm pattern that you're following. Because your left hand really is what the is indicative of the rhythm pattern. So that's something that I very much enjoy having at my disposal is this little these bags of tricks so that I can kind of pick one out. And I don't always stick to the same formula for a song. Sometimes I just make choices in the moment and see what comes up, you know. Uh, but you might plan out, I want to do this in this section and this in this section, and there's no wrong way to do it. You are in the driver's seat, okay? The other uh, one that we talked about were harmonic <clears throat> enhancements, and that's where we're maybe changing the voicing of the chord. Uh, we can do that by different inversions of the chord, if you haven't ever heard of inversions. So this is what we call root inversion. The root of the chord in this A chord is A, right? So your thumb is on A, C sharp, E. So that's the one, three, five. Well, guess what? It's still an A major chord if you play those in a different configuration. So your thumb could be on C sharp. And E and A can be at the top, like this. Still an A chord. But it sounds different, right? Voiced differently. Same is true here. This is So this is first inversion. This is second inversion. Thumb on E. A is in the middle. The C sharp. The 3 is up on top. So you could, if you get more familiar with the chords and you get more familiar with the inversions and we have we're, we have ways that we uh, familiarize ourselves with that that we talk about over at the Piano Man Approach then now you can kind of choose different inversions of the chord at different times just, just to make it a little more interesting just to make it sound a little more interesting than constantly so it could be like this Notice this F sharp minor chord, instead of playing it here, I'm in first inversion. Not only does it sound a little make it sound a little interesting, but it's also less of a jump. I don't have to move my hand down like this. I'm basically in the same spot on the piano. So once you are familiar with where the inversions are, this actually becomes a exercise in efficiency as well because your hand isn't making these big colossal jumps you're just kind of working within the same area that you're at every breath you take every move you make every vow you break and now the natural place to go for the d chord which has d f sharp a right my finger was already on an F sharp. My thumb
thumb was already on an A, so instead of interacting with that C sharp for the F sharp minor, now I can just interact with that D for the D major. Value break every single day. And now I have a choice to make. For E, I could simply slide up a whole step and be right there. Right? Second inversion E. Or I could slide down a whole step and be in first inversion E. It's up to you. What sounds best to you? Every bring you bring. I'll be watching you. So that's the nice thing about inversions. They create sonic uh they they create a sort of interesting uh variety of sonic textures, but they also make it more efficient for you to play. So you're getting a little extra bang for your buck. It's a good enhancement, but it's also makes it easier. And the cool thing is that you can slowly work yourself up and down the keyboard using inversions of chords uh, without a lot of effort. And that can make it kind of interesting. So like, watch this. I'm going to play, I'm going to play maybe, you know, a little bit longer phrase here, but watch how my hand kind of slowly works its way up and then kind of works its way down. But it's kind of seamless because I'm using inversions of chords to do it. So that's something that's kind of nice about inversions. And then uh, another thing that you might do with the chords is you can choose. Sometimes the chords will tell you. And in fact, I think the chords down in the, uh, the appropriate chords occasionally have like a seven or something on them. Um, sometimes the chords will specifically tell you it's a seven chord or a, a suspended chord or whatever. Um, but a lot of times in rock and pop, music and country music you just mostly have major and minor chords not always but a lot of times but you can decide to add a seven or a major seven or an added nine or something to a chord you don't have to just stick to what they did necessarily um and part sometimes the reason that they did it the way they did was because adding that extra note was a little bit clunky with the number of instruments that were playing but it's just you so you can actually do that and you can create a little bit of harmonic interest so one of my favorites in fact i just put a, a video out uh, i think maybe a couple weeks ago uh, on youtube at the time that i'm filming this anyway you might be seeing this 10 years from now, for all I know. But uh, I love to add in what they call the added nine. Okay? And the added nine is the two. One, two, three, four, five. 
the reason they call it the added nine is that if you jump at an octave, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? And it also, if you put the word nine, if you put the number nine next to a chord, it usually implies that you're also playing the seven, but when you put add nine, it just means you're adding that in and you don't have to play anything else. So I love the way that sounds. So I will often add that in and sometimes I'll just replace the three with that. It's such a nice sound. See how this, this major chord, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It's the most important chord in all of music is the major triad. But when you change it to this, there's a little character to it. There's a little, just a little bit of secret special sauce in that added nine, I think. And so I use that all the time. And so. This is the added nine in the D chord. Right? So I'm just playing it in a different inversion. Same thing here with the E chord. And it works fine on minor chords as well. This F sharp minor, you could easily... Right? It, it implies. You can kind of hear... Every breath... will say in minor chords I do like to include that minor three most of the time and not just replace it because I really like drawing the contrast between minor chords and major chords people will generally hear a chord as a major chord unless you make sure that it's clear that it's not a major chord so I like that remember minor chords are sad sounding and major chords are happy sounding right so I like drawing that contrast when I get there, but that add nine is just so nice. And it's whether you're doing a toggle. Or whether you're doing an arpeggio. if you're just pounding the chord. And you don't have to stay on it. You can, one thing I like to do sometimes is to play the added nine chord and then a little bit and then sort of resolve it up to the major chord. So on this section, I might be like, since you've lost, I've been gone. So see how I moved to the major? Added nine. Major. Added nine. Major. Added nine. Added nine. Major. Added nine. See how it's just another tool that you can reach into the box for. There's no perfect or right or wrong way to implement it. It's just something that you can play around with. And these simple tricks do not require your hand to go all up and down. The You don't have to get real busy and crazy. A lot of times the simplest stuff is the best, but you're, you're already playing this chord. Your hand is already right here of the keys necessary to do nice cool sounding stuff 
is accessible right where your fingers already are. Right? That's what I like. That's where I think the most effective playing comes, especially in rock and pop music, is where the it's directly accessible to you right where you're at. And so and so you can reach for these simple harmonic and simple melodic, you know, enhancements and do lots of cool stuff, make your rhythm patterns sound better, make the whole thing just sound more musically interesting and yet you're not really having to do anything all that complicated. It's just stuff that's available to you where your hand would already be. So the person who's at the very beginning of their journey with this, who's not really ready to make any of those enhancements, but it's just doing this. Every breath you take. Every move you make. Right? That person, as they get more solid with what they're doing there, they're very, very close to being able to do all this fun stuff because their hand is already in the right place. Right? Every breath, it's not a far jump from this to this. And it's not a far jump from that to this. a far jump from that to this so that's what I love about this is this is just always there's always another level of sophistication that you can open up for yourself by simply getting good at the level that you're already at. And these tricks can be layered on top of themselves. And the comp the really complex stuff is nothing more than really simple stuff being layered and stacked on top of itself. And that's what I love about this method. So the only other thing I'm going to mention is that some songs have signature lines. And this song kind of has one. But most of the time, a uh, signature line, if it's really, really important to, you know, if the, the song is highly identified with it, someone's probably notated it out. So that's one place that you can look if you can read music. Another place that you can look is that usually those signature lines, somebody's covered them in a YouTube video tutorial. So you can learn just the signature line in sort of a note-for-note -note way if you want. But they're also usually based on the chords, and so I do a lot of work in, in my courses for how to actually use the chords to figure out and pick out. You can pick out melodies, and, and you can figure out a lot of these, uh, the essence at least, of a lot of these signature lines by ear uh, when, you, uh, when you know what to look for and what to listen for. And uh, so... But in this case, for instance, the the guitar is kind of going. Right. So if you really wanted to be a stickler and you could hear that and pick it out, it's kind of the signature might be. Which is nothing more than these are the notes from an A major with an added nine in it a c sharp e one three five and that b is your added nine that's an f sharp minor with an added nine following exactly the same pattern Five, one, excuse me, five, nine, five, three, four, nine, five. 
if you really, really want to copy the record as much as possible, you can do that and just kind of hold that all the way through. Personally, I get bored doing that kind of thing, so I might do it just at the beginning as sort of an intro to the song. some kind of rhythm patterny stuff the kind of stuff we're talking about but just to be clear you don't have to follow that signature exactly and have and to have it sound good like it there's nothing wrong i do uh by request live streams every sunday for example and people ask me for stuff where it's like i've never actually played that one but i've heard it enough times that i think i can fake my way through it if i have the lyrics and the chords and I'm not going to try and nail every single signature line the first time I play it like that. And if I'm not ever, if I'm not going to make it like a regular part of my repertoire, I don't have any reason to get that specific with it, right? So if someone asked me to do this song and I didn't have a lot of familiarity with it, I might very well just sit down and do this and it's going to sound just fine. It's like the signatures are cool, but don't like don't hold yourself hostage to signature lines because uh, most of the song isn't signature lines. Most of the song is comping on chords, and there's so many fun things you can do that that really carry the essence of the song without ever getting so specific. And then and then you can enjoy playing the song while you learn sometimes the difficult or more specific signature line. All right. So that's that's my advice. And that's what I do. And uh, when you can do 90 percent of the tune, uh, the other 10 percent is fun to work on and perfect. But uh, but you don't have to hold yourself hostage to the 10 percent that sometimes is just flatly above your skill level for right now. And you're going to have a lot more practice to get that last 10% than you do to get the first 90. And I'm like, well, there's no reason not to enjoy playing the song anyway, right? Like, you know enough of the song to enjoy playing it as you can and then work your way up to that last 10%. So hopefully this has been enlightening, uh, useful, not just for this song, but hopefully you've picked up some ideas that you can take with you to other songs that you love and a process that uh, makes it a lot more fun to dive in and try things. That's what we're going for. I don't want this to just be esoteric, uh, theological, or theoretical, theological, theoretical stuff. I want this to be practical, usable information you can take with you to the songs that you love right now. So um, please let me know if uh, we achieve that goal and what else you might want me to cover in the future. I love to mostly do these videos based on requests that have been coming in for uh, from the field, from those of you who are watching, both my paid students and just my, uh, my YouTube viewers out there. So if there's songs you want me to do demos for, and if there are concepts in the piano that you would like more clarity on, just uh, leave a comment or reach out to me at pianomansteve at gmail.com and let me know. Uh, what those things are, and I'll see if I can work them into a free lesson Friday. We do it every week, and we're not running out of ideas or time. So thank you very much for tuning in, and I'm going to let it be good enough there. If the uh, As you move forward, the one thing I would invite you to do is to remember my personal mantra 
all right, which is if you're not having fun when you're making music, you're doing it wrong. And uh, come check out some of the free stuff over at pianomanapproach.com and uh, join my mailing list so that you never miss a notification about these three videos that come out on the regular, guys. All right, Piano Man Steve signing out for now. Bye-bye. <laughs>